OK, before Caroline comes to talk to you about occupational health, we have a practical demonstration. You're all going to participate. So to start with, everybody stand up, please. And all of everybody goes, oh, I don't want to have to stand up. But stand up, please. Now, if you have a cuff button, sit down, please, and undo the cuff button. If you have a watch with a watch strap, a buckle watch strap, and take that, take your watch off and sit down, please. Right. Anybody else? Have you got a button at all on your attire? Mm -hmm. A button? Oh, I knew that one there. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, if you've got a, a shirt button, so you have a shirt button, sit down and undo a shirt button, please. Okay. Well, the rest of you unfortunately can't participate, but you can watch the others struggle. Now, everybody, stand up again, please. Now you have undone your button or taken your watch off. Uh, now with one hand, please do up your button or your watch strap without using your thumb. With one hand. Not a chance now. <laughs> and sit down when you've done it. No. No. Not being annoyed. You can't. <coughs> I think we're going to be here for some time, aren't we? Not an easy thing to do. We could be here for five, ten minutes trying to do that. OK, please sit down. You can uh, reuse your thumbs if you need to adjust your attire. Imagine what it's like not to have a thumb on one hand. Has anybody here lost a digit at all? No, you've all got a full complement. Well, it's very different when you uh, lose a finger or a thumb. Uh, it does affect your life uh, in a great way. Uh, it'll take you a lot longer to get dressed, to eat your food, and a lot of other things that you do as a, uh, normally throughout your day. So look after your hands. You need to do a personal risk assessment before you take on a task at work. So you don't need your thumbs to count out a personal risk assessment. You need to look around you and assess and have a look at what hazards are around you. You need to assess the risk of those hazards hurting you. You then need to imagine the injuries that you might sustain if that hazard does hurt you. And finally, you need to change the way that you behave to make sure that those hazards don't hurt you. So four steps to a personal risk assessment. And if you carry out those four steps every time you start a task, doesn't matter what it is, how menial, could be a bit of DIY, it could be at work, you carry out a personal risk assessment and you will think twice about doing something stupid. That's all. Look after your, fing your fingers. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Caroline Walker, who's from Keir Construction. She's the occupational health representative yeah. from, our, yeah. from our health and safety department. Uh, and she's going to talk you through uh, her presentation. Thank you. So, good morning, ladies and gents. Oh, let, let me give you the. Um... Do you think I'll need it? Can you hear me all? No, you need it for the. Um, oh, do for I? The, for, for the, the recording? Yeah. Oh, I'll well, put it in my pocket without destroying it. <coughs> Thank you, sweetie. You got it. Yeah. Okay. So, let me try that again. Good morning. Can I just get an idea of what different industries? we've got in the room. Over here. Construction and maintenance. Construction maintenance. Electrical. Electrical. Construction, plumbing and heat. Plumbing and heating. Construction, civils. Civils. Construction. Residential. Residential. Construction, civil engineering. Okay. Electrical. Electrical. Architect. Oh, okay. Construction. General. Okay. The reason I say that is our previous speaker mentioned about um, the number of deaths in our last HSE statistics is now down to 39 deaths. That's a great achievement, I think, in industry. We've pretty much got safety sorted. Yeah? You agree? Yeah, we've got our edge protection sorted out. Yeah, we're tidying up our sites so there's less trips slips, falls, things like that, we are getting better. 
We're not crushing as many people with plants and machinery. But if you compare that figure with how many deaths there were from health issues, the number is very different. Can anybody hazard a guess to how many deaths there were through health-related issues? Anybody know? It was thousands. So we're talking about 39 people died through injury, so either from falling off things, being crushed by plant, that sort of thing. But 33,000 people lost their lives through ill health conditions. I mean, that's that, isn't it? That's the top of the iceberg and the bottom of the iceberg scenario, isn't it? You agree? I mean, I think, personally, that's a shocking difference. Now, I've, I've had this talk with management levels, directors, with operatives on the ground, and a lot of guys will turn around and say to me, yeah, but surely a lot of those are historic illnesses, things like asbestosis, mesothelioma, and that's true. So they're illnesses that they've contracted from many years ago, and unfortunately, later on in life, that's when unfortunately the illness catches up with them and then they pass away. But it's actually irrelevant because the illness, the death catches up with them and that's when it's recorded when they pass away. The thing with occupational ill health through the difference from an accident injury, how people end up unfortunately dying, is that when you have an accident from a safety hazard, yeah, sometimes the worst case scenario is the injury, say for example, a compound fracture, which is pretty bad when it happens on site, whether that's been through compact <coughs> um, impact with a piece of plant or falling off um, an unprotected edge, that injury will heal. My colleague Steve just mentioned, has everybody got all their digits here? I've met many a carpenter that's gone to shake my hand and they've got a digit missing. But those people will adapt and come back to work. Yeah? I'm sure you've met a few of those people within the industry themselves that those people are like. Yeah, a broken bone will heal sometimes within six to eight weeks and that person is back at work. The difference between occupational ill health conditions is that repeated exposure builds up over a matter of time. A little bit of dust today, a little bit more dust tomorrow, a bit more the day after that. And eventually, something like silica, for example, which is effectively, if it's respirable, those tiny little bits that get all the way down into the alveoli, the tiny little air sacs in the lungs that can't be breathed or coughed up, sit there in the base of the lung where the body's protective system is to cover it up with scar tissue. Yeah, and then it stops the lungs being able to be pliable as they were. And eventually, that person, years down the line, his only buddy is an oxygen tank and an oxygen mask sitting in his armchair for his retirement plan. The same with noise-induced hearing loss, another occupational ill health condition. A little bit more loud noise exposure today, a little bit more tomorrow. And eventually, while you get home after your day's work, or the operative gets home after their day's work, and wonders why they come in and sit down, favourite spot on the armchair, grabs the remote control. You know, the family are already listening to the TV at a set volume, but you come in and you start pumping the volume up and you wonder why. <coughs> Bless you. Yeah, it's because you've already started to lose certain hearing. Those outside um, frequencies that start dropping off because of that noise exposure. Musculoskeletal damage is exactly the same. How many of you still bend down to pick something up like that? Go on, put your hands up. Because you know it's easy, don't you? How many of you have got children? How many of you have got toddlers? And when you get home from work, do you go down like that to pick them up as they come in to greet you from work, instead of going down like that and bending your knees? Of course you do. Because you don't actually think more about it. You just want to pick them up and grasp them, grasp them in your arms. It's a natural thing to do. But if you watch that toddler go to pick something up, when they drop something on the floor, how do they go to pick it up? 
Yeah, the nappy normally hits the deck before anything else, doesn't it? Why do they do that? It's natural. It's natural, it's their instinct. They learn from us. They learn their bad mistakes from us. Occupational ill health builds up from repeated exposures. <clears throat> Occupational health, my job within Kia, is raising the profile of the H. Because I think most industries, especially within construction, have sorted out the S. The S is massive. And we're pretty much doing very well at the E as well. Yeah, environmental issues we're getting on top of. But the S, which is made up of skin issues, musculoskeletal disorders, hand on vibration, etc., etc., which I'm going to cover with you now, that's just one of them. Wide range of conditions. Do you recognise any of those on those pretty nasty images? I hope you've all had your breakfast already, by the way. <coughs> Anyone recognise any of those conditions? Yes. Yeah. Sunburn. Well, actually, that one's not. That's, that's contact dermatitis. But never mind. We'll get to hand, hand on vibration in a little while. This one here, it is. Yeah, well done. These are all work conditions. These have all been sparked by work <coughs> conditions. What about this one? This is quite a famous pair of legs here. This, th this image has been going around for years. Concrete the concrete burns, burns. yeah. Mm -hmm. So not a disease exactly, but something contracted at work. Yeah, this guy that ended up like this, so we've already mentioned doing risk assessments and stuff, personal risk assessments. If any of you are supervisory level, managers, owners of businesses, doing risk assessments for your staff, this guy came into work as an agency worker for a concreting gang. He wasn't given the right PPE. He came in, yeah, started work at 8 o'clock in the morning. What time do you normally take your first break? About 10 o'clock. At 10 o'clock, he goes to have a tea break with the rest of the guys, but his legs were a bit sore by this point. So he thought he'd go and have a look in the washrooms. And they weren't quite this state, but they were getting there already. And the wet concrete had soaked through his overalls, and that's all he'd been given. <coughs> Not wet proofs, just normal overalls. You can see where he'd been kneeling down in it. And then he was rushed to hospital, almost lost a leg. <coughs> what about this one here? This one actually makes me giggle a bit, and it shouldn't do. That's this guy works, or used to work, up north. Coal mine in. Staple industry. Yeah, he's suffering with something called black lung. Now, you can see that he's, got, he's in the washroom at the end of his working day. He's got this lovely clean body, so he's actually had good body protection on. But where else should he have a white mark on him? There, shouldn't he? But just to make sure that the black coal dust he's been breathing all in all day sticks properly good, can you see what's hanging out of his mouth? He's got a fag on the go. How about this? What do you think these represent? Could be carpal tunnel. How many of you use computers? How many of you work with people that use computers? How many of your staff sit in an office on site using computers? How often do you do the risk assessments for those people? <coughs> Not very often, I should imagine. Yeah, our static offices tend to be on top of DSE risk assessments, but the site offices, they take whatever you give them for a desk and a computer and a chair. Most of the time, the, the caster wheels are falling off, the guys come in and they're balancing on the edge. Most of the guys, in fact, on a lot of the construction offices we see nowadays, they work on laptops. How long should a laptop be used in any one long spell of time? What do the regs suggest? The DSE regs? Regular breaks. <coughs> Regular breaks, yes. But what, what's, a, what's a laptop's use for?
Come on, you can speak to me. I don't bite. I know I look a bit vicious, but I only nibble a bit, I promise. It's a display screen. It's a display screen piece of equipment, <coughs> but so is a PDA. So is a mobile phone. A laptop's use should only be about 40 minutes use, because they're not designed for prolonged use. So to make it safe, what should we be providing with a laptop? Yes, separate keyboards, separate screen where possible and if necessary <coughs> to stop people ending up with things like this. And obviously it's not just computers that cause carpal tunnel, but you'll see people using their mouse doing this. Is this the right way to be manoeuvring a mouse? Is that how you use your mouse? Bet it is. Using the rotator cuff at the shoulder is how you should be using your mouse. This bit stays flat and straight all the time. That's how you should be using your mouse. But if you've not been taught that, how do you know? What about these? Disc. Yeah. Press discs. Back problems. How many of you in the room have got back problems? <laughs> I thought that would be a big show. Musculoskeletal disorders and stress is the biggest working time lost for any of us now. If any of you do absenteeism, um, audits in your businesses, yeah, that would be costing you thousands, and if you're a really big business, millions every year, and presenteeism costs as well for the amount of people that have to go and take a break because of the amount of pain they're suffering from sitting at their desks or being out on site trying to lift things. We've got a brilliant company with us here today in that back right-hand corner. We've got one of their team coming to do a speak for you today that can help you do audits be interesting if you take advantage of them to find out how much absenteeism costs are costing you for people that are stressed out or have got musculoskeletal problems. Because that, those two things, are the things that are costing industry massively. And the other thing, of course, are respiratory problems, which is why the HSC are targeting that at the moment. There you go, that's a breakdown of things which are giving us problems in the construction industry. Keyboard work factors heavily, but heavy lifting, manipulating materials. Yeah, when we see the guys doing concrete work, twisting metal work, that's where you can get carpal tunnel as well, but also just the positions that they have to stand and straddle the metal work to work on. Yeah, it's a difficult one. But if we give them necessary breaks, if we give them stretching exercises, if we get them to work on those muscles that need to support them, it will reduce the working time loss and the injuries. No matter how crazy they think that is, I'm not saying that we all should go into the Hong Kong style type of work where we all do the workout every morning before we get into work, but there is something to be said about it. Yeah, because it will reduce injury. <coughs> There you go, there's your vibration white finger. Any motorcyclists in the room? Yeah, so take that into consideration as well, depending on what sort of capacity motorcycle you're riding. And then whether you're doing that and riding into work and then using vibration tools. Do you use vibration tools on the weekend as well as at work? <coughs> Make this holistic. Ask your employees about it. Because sometimes if they're using two <coughs> wheels to get into work and then picking up a drill or picking up a Kango, all that adds to their trigger time. Yeah, look at the bigger picture. This is all important stuff that can affect their overall health. How many of you do your hand-arm vibration risk assessments and use the, HAV, uh, use the HSC's um, calculator? Do you know how to use it? Is that yes? Is that a no? Yes. If you don't know how to use it, ask for assistance. Kia have people like me to help go around the sites and help their teams do that. But if you don't, there are companies that can help you do that. Again, here on the Isle of Wight, you've got a company at the back there that can help you do that. There are people that can help you do that. But if the HSC turn up on site, especially with fees for intervention running wild at the moment, because that's how they make their money, and they throw that at you and ask you to see the risk assessments, it's about the monitoring as well. If they ask you to see the stats, 
How long has this guy been using that piece of equipment? How did you work out how long he could use that piece of equipment? And you can't prove to them that's a letter. That's a fine. Yeah, so you should know. And as management, if you are management, you should know. And then you should cascade that down. Have a champion. Have a HAV champion. Have a respiratory champion. Have a noise champion. Yeah? It's all worth it. It really is. Remember those figures. People getting ill. We're also a wor aging workforce in the UK. Yeah, we're not producing many youngsters as much as we should be. So the aging workforce on our sites need to be taken care of even more. The average age for a worker, including a subcontractor on a Keir site, anyone want to hazard a guess? 30 odd. 30 odd, no. No. Any more? Any more offers? <coughs> Try a little bit higher than that. 51. <laughs> you charmer. <laughs> 51 is the average age for a worker on a Keir site. And that's not just Keir staff, that's the subcontractors that come and work for us. So that's quite remarkable, I think. And that just goes to show the age of the people that are actually working on Keir sites. And I'm not talking about the, you know, the foreigners that are coming into the country to work for us, that is our British working stock. Yeah, because British women aren't dropping sprogs for us that are going to come to age. So this is all important, yeah, because the, the older the body gets, the more difficult it is for us to maintain certain working limits. Other health issues. I don't know what it's like for you over here. This is my first visit to the Isle of Wight, actually, in all my nearly 50 years on the planet. But there are other issues. Contaminated land. Here you go, these two images, what are they supposed to represent? I've already mentioned the word. Stress. Do you see any of your colleagues like that? About, <laughs> I think that's a yes, the response to that. Yeah? How many of you know how to do an occupational health risk assessment? I bet that's probably none of you in this room. But it's a massive one, recognising the signs. We have an obligation as employers to notice that. Because again, it's costing industry a fortune. Especially since the recession, things are still pretty tough. We're still trying to get ourselves back on, on track. Yeah, people are undertaking more work, doing more than they would normally. And we're often asking things like project managers and site teams to do more than they would normally. Yeah, and these guys are stressed. And it affects them in many different ways. Contaminated land. Yeah, lead and how that can affect the body. Limp-wristed has a complete new meaning when you've been affected by lead because those are the, it affects the joints in the body. Yeah, Guranu, pigeon poo, otherwise known as. Yeah, any of you are working on refurbishment products, uh, projects, you know, pigeon poo can make you blind. It's knowing about these things and how they can affect you and your teams. Those are just some of the projects that Kia works on. That's how they should look. That's how we should be. We should be communicating with one another and sharing best practice. Agreed? How important is your health? How important is the health of the workers that you work alongside? Health surveillance is a reactionary measure. All these things only come into play if you've got the controls right in the first place. Have you measured the levels of dust? Have you measured the levels of noise? Does it need bringing in control? Remember, PPE is the last level of control. It's at the bottom of the hierarchy of control. Have you ever seen somebody chasing out a wall? Do you actually see them when they're chasing out a wall? If you can see them and they're not using dust extraction. You create something like 20 pounds of dust when you're chasing out a wall. So if you're using dust extraction, you will 
be able to see them. They will be extra protected. But will they still need a face fit mask? Yeah, and the mask needs to be face fit tested. There's another colleague at the back there that can tell you about face fit testing. If you're handing somebody a mask, there he is, just put his hand up. If you're giving somebody a mask, it has to be fit for purpose. Kia have introduced a mandatory eye protection policy and we get a lot of the guys going, oh, I don't like these glasses, they steam up. Often, they only steam up because their mask isn't fitting properly. So you need to make sure that all those controls are in place. I'm here for the morning, so if any of you have got any questions, please come and ask, but otherwise, that's me. Thank you very much for listening.